All right, we're going to go ahead and get this thing started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the DNS track. My name is Dwayne. Uh, a lot of you I know were, were in the DNS OARC uh, workshop the previous couple of days, but for all the new faces, thank you for coming. Uh, we hope you find all this material interesting. Uh, we got, we're here for a couple hours. We've got six presentations, and we're going to start off with an introduction from Mr. Keith, Keith Mitchell to, to tell a little bit about DNS OARC. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Keith Mitchell, ORC President. We've done something that we've been kind of wanting to do for a while um, over the past few days, which is, um, as well as having a ORC workshop back to back with NANOG, actually doing a bit of coordination on the um, the content. So quite most of the presentations you're about to see are actually a reprise or shorter version of material that we have presented at our, our workshop over the past two days. So if you find it interesting. Um, would just like to tell you a little bit about our work and maybe maybe this is something that is um, relevant to what you're doing. So what does our work do? Okay. Um, we're basically here to um, act as a focus um, non-profit neutral membership organization um, to facilitate coordination within the operators um, that are focused on DNS issues and also to work with the research community. And there's various ways that we do that. Um, we, we facilitate research, we do software tools, we help to build community relations just like Anog does, um, and um, workshops, and also just trying to distribute clue and do education. Um, we've been trying to explain this a little bit better for um, people who um, don't necessarily um, get all of that on the, on, on the first pass. And we think we're a little bit like a library. Um, we have a huge collection of data, um, but we don't just store the books, we make them available, we perform scholarly analysis and research on them. More importantly, we facilitate others to do that. Um, and we have a Friends of the Library program where you can give us money to, to facilitate all this and also um, get access to events like our workshops. Um, Here's all the usual suspects in the DNS world that are, are members. Um, this isn't a completely exhaustive list, but it's, it's um, all of them up until a few months ago. Um, and um, you can see there's a lot of CCTLDs in there, there's a lot of GTLD operators, there's address registries, there's vendors, um, there's um, ISPs who operate larger cursive resolver farms. Um, Data gathering is a big part of what we do. Um, we also have various tools um, for member-only sharing of information so that um, if there are strange things which are impacting your infrastructure, there is a chance to discuss these confidentially without necessarily tipping off the bad guys that you're, you're on to them. Um, and um, governance, well, this is all kind of cookie gutter stuff within the industry now. Um, we're a 501c3, um, legal entity registered in the US, um, trading in California. Um, we're doing about six to seven hundred K of annual revenue um, and that's that's done on a, a sustainable basis. Um, we have neutrality and self-governance. Um, we just had a, a board election um, from among the community um, and for various services that we do we contract a number of, of um, staff um, who, who perform, like myself, uh, in fact, um, all but one of them are here in the room. So if you uh, if you want to talk to us, we're we're available. We also have a program committee. Um, two of the program committee members are sitting here, which is how we achieve the coordination. And they're doing some really awesome work within the program committee in terms of getting the content that we um, we have at the workshop. So what have we done um, this year so far? Uh, we hired a project development manager um, to, to get involved in, in, in more activities in terms of developing tools and services. Um, we've been doing big data for over a decade now. Um, and the good news is that's a lot cheaper and easier than when we started. So we've been adding storage capacity. Um, our main data set is over 80 terabytes. Uh, we just added a record amount of nine terabytes to it. We do this thing we call the day in the life of the internet every year where we collect um, data from authoritative servers for 48 hours 
and add that to our archive. We also did something new, um, the root operators of um, publishing um, data about their operations to, an R to a standard RSAC 002 that's been created by RSAC. Um, they're all publishing that independently. What we're doing is collating and gathering and archiving it in perpetuity. Um, I'm pleased to say we've made good headway in terms of growing our subscription revenue from members um, and also, um, uh, I won't quite say booting out the freeloaders, but certainly um, cleaning up some of the, um, the legacy um, participant categories that we have. Um, and we've also started charging a, a, a small um, amount to cover our costs for workshops. Um, it's cheaper than Nanog, um, but you know, obviously we would like members, this is the benefit that you have if you're a member, is, 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 is to send free delegates to the workshop. Um, if you've been thinking about ORC membership in the past but thought that's too expensive, we have a couple of new membership categories. Um, if you're doing things that contribute to research and understanding of the DNS, then you know, maybe you're an academic, you might want to consider a supporter membership. Um, and we've also got a new entry member um, category, which only, it's, it's only a thousand a year, but it's limited to individuals or, um, or small organizations. So we just had our um, fall workshop. Um, as Dwayne mentioned, um, 25 presentations. We had about 40 submitted, so um, the 25 is the good stuff. Um, you can see all the slide decks um, at our meeting site, which we're also putting the slide decks for this um, um, track on. Um, the videos are already there. Um, uh, Dave Knight did an awesome job um, webcasting it all, so that's all on YouTube um, if you want to see any of the presentations that you missed. Um, and we had 130 attendees. Um, a big thank you to Sierra as our local um, sponsor um, and for the social. Nominum also sponsored us and you know we like to um, work with other events such as Nanog and Nanog's always great for, for helping us out with connectivity and other aspects. Um, as I said we had board elections. Um, congratulations to Paul as our newest board member and also to Dave and Dwayne um, who have been re-elected. Um, this is the staff, as I say, all of us except William are around um, for um, the next couple of days, so please do come and speak to us if you want to know more about ORC. Um, so, yeah, so technical stuff. Um, we have quite a lot of physical infrastructure. Um, we have various reasons why we need to continue with physical rather than cloud infrastructure. We recently upgraded it to 10 gig. Having said that, the physical infrastructure that we have is going to have to be moved. Um, so we'll be working, we're working on a plan for that and um, we'll certainly be talking to, to members, call providers and other parties um, about the hosting that we need to, uh, to replace our existing equipment. Um, we've also just started running a mailing list for the ICANN CCNSO SCCIR group. Um, so that's um, something new that we're doing. And we've also been looking at um, some trust group platform um, as they are aware of providing more vetted and secure communications and relationship management amongst our members. Um, so that's it. I mean, that's my um, vegetables. You can now get on with the technical meat from the other presentations. Happy to take any questions. Um, one of the things that we do with our workshops that our members have expressed a strong preference is that we collocate NANOG, ICANN, RIPE, ITF meetings. Um, so our next one will be with the ITF. First time we've been to South America and Buenos Aires. Um, in a year's time, um, we can get the members to decide whether to come back to Nanog in a year or whether to collocate with the ICANN meeting. Um, but um, well, certainly, we're, we were with RIPE in Amsterdam earlier this year and we'll be going back there in spring 2017 and highly likely that we'll be collocating with Nanog in two years' time. Um, so, um, happy to take any questions or, or happy to, uh, to follow up with any of you um, after the, uh, the session. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Keith. Um, so our first presentation today is from uh, Brian, Brian Summers, who's going to tell us uh, how his company handles uh, certain DDoS attacks. And, whoa. Looks like you started in the middle of your talk or something. I don't know what's going on there. All right. <laughs> so... Um, this may or may not work. This works. I'm trying not to touch that. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, I'm uh, Brian Summers. Uh, I work with OpenDNS. I'm a site reliability engineer, so we're responsible for maintaining the DNS infrastructure, getting configuration changes out to it, and 
developing it to deal with operational issues um, and <coughs> other projects within the company. Um, I've always been interested in the networking side of, uh, of software. I've worked in software for 28 years, and uh, more cares more years than I care to um, uh, to remember. Um, but ironically, my current job working with DNS uh, has a big effect on the network, so it's probably quite appropriate to uh, to present here. So I'm going to talk about uh, DNS denial of service um, attacks. Most of them are. Um, Is that better? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about denial of service attacks. Um, most of them are distributed, um, but not all of them. So the first and most simple uh, type of attack is the accidental attack. It's when people have something misconfigured, might be sending the same query over and over again, or it might be a misconfigured uh, development box looking up local hosts because it lost the content of Etsy hosts or some such thing. Um, there are amplification attacks, which are kind of old school these days. Um, we don't see, well, maybe we do see them, but uh, we don't care about them that much anymore because we seem to have them nailed. Um, this is where the source address is falsified, and they send a small query um, soliciting a big response. Um, usually it's going through a domain that the bad guys own, so the guy, bad guys will pre-set up record uh, responses of certain sizes. Um, to try to get the maximum response size out of the resolver. Um, so they might set up a record uh, with uh, a response with 1,000 bytes, 1,024 bytes, uh, 1,500 bytes, 2,000 bytes, 4,000 bytes. Most uh, recursive resolvers will give you answers up to 4K um, if you uh, send an eDNS buff size option. Um, so they'll, they'll have these uh, um, answers pre-prepared um, they'll falsify the source address in the DNS query um, to be the guy that they want to attack, and they'll send queries as fast as they can, and then we send responses. They don't care whether um, the response is in the cache or not. Um, their desired result is that we send answers to the, uh, the, the target of the attack. And then we've got our, um, our NX domain attacks, um, or our um, random label attacks. Um, these are the, the most difficult ones to deal with. Um, so they usually target what looks like an authority. They're actually targeting the IPs that are nominated as the name servers of their domain that they're attacking. So usually, again, the domain will be owned by the bad guys. The bad guys will point their name servers at the guy that they don't like. And then they'll send lots and lots of queries to us um, for that domain with random labels um, at the start of the queue name which means that we haven't got them cached, we send our queries upstream, and to us upstream is the IP number of the target. So the target gets lots and lots of queries. So the first two types, the accidental attack and the amplification attack, are reasonably easy to, um, to deal with because the source address is constant. Um, it stays the same throughout the, uh, um, throughout the attack, it's not falsified, um, so we can just limit um, the responses that we send based on um, too many queries from one source address. Um, to do this, we have um, lots of metrics around each query that we receive. Um, so our metrics would include um, counts around the number of A records, the number of quad A records, MX records, etc. But also metrics around the response sizes that we're delivering back to the, uh, to the clients um, and whether or not they're a customer, what class of customer they are. Um, we count all of these up, we have different rate limits for each of these numbers, and when they exceed the rate limit, we stop sending the responses. If they continue to, uh, um, uh, to persist with the attack, then from second to second, we reduce their limits by 10%, which means that after, t after 10 seconds of sustained attack, the limit is now equal to one. So they could be sending us 10,000 10, queries per second, and we're actually responding to one of them. And it's very convenient in this case because certainly in the case of the amplification attack, the attacker doesn't actually know that we're not sending any responses, not unless he has some way of monitoring the, uh, uh, the target's network. 
The um, random label attack uh, um, needs a little bit of a, dis um, a kind of step back. So in order to identify a random label attack, what we're currently doing is we're leaving it up to our big data systems to be able to correlate the data and tell the resolvers when there's a random label attack going on. Um, our big data system gets query logs from all of the resolvers. They, um, they all feed into the, um, uh, the big data system. And the big data systems um, will identify when it starts to see um, a huge number of domains um, being responded to with negative responses. Um, so there have to be 500 uh, unique domain, domains queried under a given uh, um, zone. Um, which is unusual in itself, but if 95% of those responses are negative responses and again 30% of those negative responses are serve fails, then this looks like an attack. Um, so it figures out what the, what the longest domain name uh, um, satisfying all of those criteria are and it, it classifies that as an attack. And then it does one of three things with, the, with this uh, information. So the first one is the, the easy thing. If the uh, domain in question has less than 100 queries, um, or less than an average of 100 queries per hour over the last two weeks, then we just drop the data on the floor. So the big data systems feed the, um, the domain name back to us. We put it in a drop list file, and that drop list file is squirted out to all the resolvers. The resolvers honor it by um, matching the domain name as it comes into the resolver and just dropping the data on the floor. However, of course, if uh, we have a domain name that's a little bit more popular than that, then nobody's going to appreciate all of that data being dropped on the floor. So for domains between 100 and 500,000 queries per hour, we behave slightly differently. We put it in a different list. Um, our resolver is full of lists of uh, domains that we need to behave differently for. Um, but this list is a freeze list. And the idea behind the freeze list needs another step backwards. Um, I'll explain how our cache works, our cache isn't a kind of ever-growing um, uh, cache. It's a pre-allocated cache. Um, most of our resolvers currently just allocate 10 gigs of memory for the cache. And the cache has a head pointer and a tail pointer. And um, the head pointer chases the tail pointer through memory. Um, and every time it needs more space to put stuff in the, in the cache, the tail pointer consumes the oldest record and the head pointer then um, gets some more space to, to store some new stuff. Um, the 10 gig cache that we have on, on most resolvers will last for about a day. So the records that we put into the cache tend to go into the cache and stay there for around about a day. When we look the cache up, we um, have a queue name, we look in the cache, we find a queue, the, the best or the most uh, recent queue name entry. And if it's in TTL, then we have a record that we can respond to the client with. If it's not in TTL, then we have to go and do an, an upstream lookup. So at any given time, we'll have a, a series of records that are, we'll have a match for a queue name that may or may not be um, uh, still within TTL. So going back to the freeze list, the way we manage the freeze list is if somebody um, sends us a query that matches the freeze list and we find that, um, that queue name in our cache, whether the queue name is um, in TTL or out of TTL, we'll treat it as a valid query. And if it's out of TTL, we'll go and look and um, relook it up upstream and we'll give the, um, uh, the client the answer. If it's not in the cache, then we don't, we drop it on the floor which means that um, the, the domain that's suddenly under attack um, will still respond to things like www.domain, but we'll stop responding to things like random label .domain. And this um, generally works. There are a couple of other kind of um, uh, aspects of this, like when we recycle a resolver, it will come back up and the freeze list won't be um, activated for five minutes after boot time so that it can see the, those records. Um, but it does mean that, uh, that attacks will leak through, so to speak. Um, so to give you an idea of what sort of uh, data rates I'm talking about, or, or at least proportional data rates, um, so this is a, a dropped graph. Um, it graphs all of the data that we're dropping on the floor um, in the recursive re resolver. Um, the pink or the magenta here represents the data that's hit the drop list. So 
of all of the data that we drop, you can see that most of it's drop list data. The yellow that uh, skimmed across the top there is rate limited data. Um, and then the blue spikes are freeze list data. Um, so stuff that uh, was more um, active domains that, uh, that we saw these, these uh, random label attacks coming through. And to put that, uh, that dropped data in perspective, um, the green stripe here is the dropped data and the purple um, piece on top of that is the um, queries that we're, we're responding to. And most of our resolvers have graphs that look very similar, similar to this. And for what it's worth, the blue at the bottom is error responses, so garbage um, domains, um, malformed packets, that sort of thing. Um, so you can see that um, you know, at non-peak times, we can be dropping up to 40% of our, our traffic just on the floor because it's dropped data. And we see very few false positives. We believe it really is just garbage data. So one of the other things that, uh, that we do, which isn't strictly speaking a denial of service attack in that we're not being used as a vehicle to attack somebody else, but it's possible that we might be accidentally attacking authorities through our, our misbehavior. And this can happen if the authorities stop responding to us for some reason. So as a recursive resolver, somebody asks us a, us a uh, question, we go to the authority, we get an answer, we keep it in the cache, we serve that, uh, that record out of the cache as much as we can when the RTT runs out, we, uh, when the uh, TTL runs out, we query upstream again. Um, if the authority doesn't respond, then we send the query upstream and we wait for a while and then we time it out and then we query upstream again and we wait for a while and we time it out. So the, the semantics are, are, the, are the, the timeouts that we use in terms of um, looking up a given queue name against an authority has suddenly changed from whatever the authority's TTL is to whatever our timeout is. And that's a surprising thing for authorities. And if authorities have um, mechanisms in place to see this happening, they might decide to firewall us. So we want to become good citizens and try to avoid that happening. So there are lots of uh, steps that we take, but I think it's easier to um, explain with a graph if I can find the graph. My graph isn't here. Uh, okay. I think this is an old uh, um, slide deck. Um, okay, so I'll explain it manually then. Um, <laughs> So I had a, a small table of, um, uh, with name servers going across the top, um, left to right, and timeouts going down the side, top to bottom. And how our resolver deals with things is it will take the name servers for a given domain and it will shuffle them and it will lay them out left to right. And then it takes a fixed set of timeouts that it will lay, um, lay out um, bottom to top, is how I like to see it. And then it basically goes through the resulting matrix and queries each name server with a given timeout. And if it doesn't respond, it goes on to the next one, the next one, and wanders all the way up the matrix. When it runs out of boxes to, to um, query, it returns serve file to the client. So what we've implemented is a mechanism, if you can um, um, picture this, this matrix that we're going through um, with timeouts down one side and name servers um, across the other. Um, we remember the round trip times that we got responses from the authorities um, uh, on a, a per IP and per queue name and per queue type, sorry, per IP, per zone and per queue type basis. So we remember the, the round trip time and if they don't respond within the timeout that we're, we're querying, then we put them at the top of that timeout, go on to the next one, next one. And we remember those round trip times for the next time we query them. So as a result, if um, two of the three name servers for a given zone um, are a little bit latent, if they take two seconds to respond or if they took, take 0.8 of a second to respond, then we're um, going to query the third um, name server in preference to those. And if one of those um, name servers is taken out of, um, uh, out of service, if it's rebooted, restarted, um, it's any cast uh, um, goes away or whatever, then we um, eventually push that name server, assuming that we don't have other name servers to, um, uh, to kind of stand in for it, we push that name server off the top of our graph or of our matrix. And when things fall off the top of the matrix, we put them into a 40 second timeout. So we just 
stop querying them altogether. And the net result of this is that um, an authority that uh, reboots all of its name servers or loses uh, net connectivity or loses the ability to respond to us will get a flurry of queries and that flurry will then um, peel off quite rapidly and then with, they'll start getting single queries to each name server every 40 seconds until the, um, the problem is solved. It's easier to explain with the, um, with the other slide. <laughs> Um, so this is the exciting part of the talk. So um, when, I, when I did this talk um, on Sunday, um, I hadn't got a very good story because on Saturday night I'd looked at the graphs and decided that my story wasn't, uh, wasn't correct. Um, and um, since then I've been, been worrying about um, uh, why my story wasn't correct and um, I have come up with the reason why it wasn't correct and I have a better story now. So this, these graphs represent a um, NX domain attack or a, a random label attack. And what tends to happen with these random label attacks, it's as if the, the bad guys have a fire hose and they decide that they're going to target person X. So they turn on their fire hose and they point it over here and they're looking at, at person X and then they turn it and point it at them and then eventually turn it away. Or in this case, what it looks like happened, if you look at that top graph, you can see the attack start, everything's fine, and nobody's um, upset with anybody. And all of a sudden we have this huge magenta block appearing on our graph, and that magenta block is representing um, dropped data that has appeared in our drop list. So there's been some sort of a random label attack, um, and it's pointing at somebody that we know is um, being abused as a random label attack and we start, decided to drop the data on the floor. Now this goes on for four hours. So they're, they're pointing the fire hose at these people for four hours and we're just dropping the traffic on the floor and nobody has, has noticed. None of the other graphs are demonstrating any sort of uh, misbehavior. So it's just a completely new fire hose that's been pointed over here. Um, four hours later, all of a sudden the, um, the drop list data completely disappears. So it looks like they've turned the fire hose and they're now pointing at somebody that um, is not in the drop list. And in fact, this, this attack was against a, a domain name called okcoin.com, which is a Bitcoin um, uh, company. Um, and I was a bit confused here because the drop list disappeared, but why weren't they added to the freeze list? Okcoin.com do um, about two and a half, three thousand um, uh, queries per hour or per ten minutes, a reasonable amount of traffic, so they should have actually um, appeared in our freeze list, but they didn't. There was no sign of them in the freeze list. What actually happened here is um, it seems that um, many of these Bitcoin um, operators have a way of um, communicating payment details via DNS wildcard.